Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show and to our St Andrew's Day special. As you see, I'm bedecked in saltire blue, but Alex, well, his kilt is still getting ironed after our Hogmanay edition. Alex is back in Scotland's capital city of Edinburgh, where he's caught up with some of Scotland's finest creative artists. But first to your tweets and messages, and still dominating is a reaction to our two-part special for Remembrance Day on the loss of the Lancastria, the largest loss of life from a naval disaster in British history. Many people were touched by the story. First we hear from Miriam. My dad survived this, she says. He had severe PTSD. He had me at the age of 50. We had to leave when I was four. Marriage and a child set his PTSD off again. He was Irish and unable to go home after the war. So he spent some time in Oz working on the Snowy Mountain Scheme. It came to light that he did that to save money, to give to a man's family who died because my dad felt for him having taken the last place on a rescue boat. Fiona says, in this awful Brexit madness, this show is wonderful. It's very moving to hear Alex talking to the survivors. Bucky Lugger says, quite an amazing show on the Lancastria, a completely new item of history for me and one that deserves full retelling. Great tribute to all who lost their lives and to the survivors too and the pain they had to go through thereafter. Bess says, my friend's dad was on it. He was lucky enough to survive. John says, my wife's uncle was a Lancastria survivor. He was fortunate to be able to throw himself overboard and then was in the water under attack from German gunfire. Terrifying. And finally, Ewan says, a terrible loss. My grandpa was on the Lancastria. He survived the sinking but suffered all his days with survivor guilt. The British government kept it a secret, but my mum and dad were part of the campaign to get the wreck recognised as a war grave. Thank you all so much for your messages. Now, last year we interviewed former Labour MP and independent Scottish Parliament member, Dennis Canavan, about the progress in his campaign to make Scotland's National Day a national holiday. Now he's back to report a fascinating development in the St Andrew Day Committee planning. Alex spoke to Dennis recently in Edinburgh. And now on the eve of St Andrew's Day, I'm delighted to be joined by the Secretary of the St Andrew's Day Committee, Dennis Canavan. Dennis, Secretary of the St Andrew's Day Committee, what do your duties entail and is it more difficult than being an MP and an MSP? Well, the cross-party group in the Scottish Parliament uh, for St Andrew's Day was just set up just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, Tom Arthur, MSP, is the convener and I am the, the, the Secretary and our aims are uh, fairly simple. First of all, to get wider recognition of the St Andrew's Day holiday and secondly, to promote the celebration of St Andrew's Day. And that means trying to give the people of Scotland, the all the people of Scotland, inclusively, the opportunity to celebrate uh, our national identity, our cultural diversity, and our membership of the international community. Now, Dennis, in uh, your long parliamentary career at Westminster and then at uh, Holyrood, one of the highlights uh, was your legislation to establish St Andrew's Day as a holiday. Now, if you managed to successfully rally the Parliament behind that legislation, why are you still campaigning for it years later? <laughs> An interesting question. Well, the legislation was eventually, after a great deal of effort, it was eventually passed unanimously, and it's now the St Andrew's Day Bank Holiday Scotland Act uh, 2007. St Andrew's Day is now officially a bank holiday, but what does a bank holiday mean? A person or a business is allowed to postpone a financial transaction until the next working day. Uh, but it doesn't oblige any employer, not even the banks, to give their workers a day off. So recognition of the holiday is unfortunately still very patchy. The Scottish Government recognises it. The Scottish I, I Parliament think, I recognises it. I think I did that, it. if I remember correctly. Yes. It's certainly a holiday for the staff. <laughs> yes, uh, the Scottish Parliament recognises it. but. In local government, I'm afraid the response has been very disappointing. And it's the idea, because the local authority is obviously in charge of the schools, and many people would argue that what makes a, a holiday a real holiday is if it's a, a school holiday so that, that families can, can enjoy it together. Was that your aim and objective in writing to local authorities? Uh, and I, I firmly believe that if, if it was a school holiday, there would be a huge increase in the recognition, because uh, most parents... 
we'd want to take the day off to celebrate with their children, and that in turn would put more pressure on employers, both in the public sector and in the private sector, to get wider recognition of the St Andrew's Day holiday. Because one of the you know, traditional arguments against from these eternal sceptics in Scottish life, and the CBI, for example, was if you have another holiday, we'll, we'll lose so much productivity, we'll lose so much business, etc. But you don't quite see it that way, do you? When you look at the international comparison, Scotland is near the bottom of the international league in terms of our number of public holidays, um, and uh, we are one of the few countries of the world that doesn't have a national holiday. I mean, the French have got Bastille Day, the Irish have got St. Patrick's Day, the United States of America even, which is a very business-orientated, capitalistic country, they've got two, at least two big national holidays, uh, namely Independence Day uh, and uh, Thanksgiving Day. And Thanksgiving Day always falls on or around uh, St. Andrew's Day. So uh, I don't see why we shouldn't have a St. Andrew's Day holiday in order to give all the people of Scotland the opportunity to celebrate their national identity, their cultural diversity, and their membership of the international community. So when you're successful, as I'm sure you will be on your track record of persuading the local authorities to have a school holiday, make it a family occasion, what are these families going to be doing? And what's this new initiative, the, the St Andrew's Day Fair Saturday? Well, this was an initiative that was started in Bilbao, uh, in the Basque country, and it began as a, a kind of antidote to Black Friday. Black Friday is very much, it's well... Consumerism. Consumerism. It's, uh, it's, it's the epitome of a greedy, grasping, selfish, ruthless society. Fair Saturday is an antidote to that because they're trying to promote fairness, they're trying to promote a caring, sharing society, and they're doing it through the celebration of uh, cultural events. And Scotland, for the first time this year, is now sharing in that. And we've got places like uh, Dundee and Glasgow and Midlothian, which are already committed, and I would hope that in time there will be many cities towns and communities throughout Scotland who will join in the St Andrew's Fair Saturday celebrations um, towards the, the, the last Saturday of November. And this is an opportunity for, for people to, by attending cultural events, some of the revenues going to good causes. I think we can probably safely say that our patron St St Andrew would have smiled in that initiative. Well, of course, there's, there's the... The, uh, the gospel story uh, about the loaves and the fishes and uh, the fact that they shared that uh, around uh, so many people. And uh, I do think that uh, if we are into the spirit of St Andrew, then trying to promote a caring, sharing society and encourage, in, encouraging individuals too, just on St Andrew's Day, to think not just of themselves, but of what they can do to help other people. I think that would be a great thing, and I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government is, is promoting that uh, initiative, and it's called um, Make Someone's Day. Well, Dennis, I can't do anything about loaves and fishes, but you are entitled to the Alex Salmon Quake for appearing on the programme to talk about the new initiatives for St Andrew's Day, and I have no need to tell the Secretary of the St Andrew's Day Committee the drill. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. I'll make sure that it is filled up with something suitable on St Andrew's Day. Dennis, thank you very much. Thank you. The leadership in the Fair Saturday campaign came from the Basque Country and has quickly spread internationally. Alex has been speaking to Jordi about the genesis of the movement and why St Andrew Fair Saturday is a welcome addition to its international reach. Jordi Alberto Ureta, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be on. Thank you. Jordi, tell us a bit about the genesis, the beginnings of the Fair Saturday movement. This is a crazy idea born in 2014 in the city of Bilbao, the region of, of Biscay in the Basque Country. A, a group of young people, we were quite worried about the kind of world we were creating for the future. So complex times, sometimes we are much more focused on destroying bridges between countries and cultures. So we, we thought about um, build another day, a different day, the day after Black Friday. Why not to try to mobilize, to provoke a massive mobilization around culture? Uh, and instead of doing that by reducing the prices, by doing that by uh, social empathy. So every cultural event that participates could support a social cause, a project of their choice. So this is how we started in Bilbao with only 17 choirs 
and now we are trying to grow globally speaking. So if Black Friday is all about receiving, Fair Saturday is all about giving. So how many countries are now participating from that small beginning in 2014 in Bilbao? This year, this year in 2018, we have around 600 and 700 events all over the world, 100 cities and I think seven, eight different countries and we are growing. So Yorty, that is 700 events in 100 cities yeah. over yeah. seven countries, eight countries? Yeah, and we are closing new cities for the next year, probably the first in the States, for example. So how excited are the Fair Saturday movement that this year, for the first time, Scotland is participating in the Fair St Andrews Saturday. Yeah, I mean, this probably is one of the best news for the movement. We started conversations through the British Consulate in, in Bilbao. We, we had the choice to share the project with, with many people. Uh, thank you to you, Alex, as well. We shared the project with the Scottish government, with Mrs Fiona Hislop, and, and for us it was very special because if there isn't a nation... Uh, focus on culture and social empathy, this is Scotland. Because how a humble, simple idea, but very powerful, has been embraced for a whole nation and uh, making it a day for giving, a day to build a fairer and a strong society around culture and social empathy. So what would the message from the Fair Saturday movement internationally and from you in Bilbao be to the St Andrew's Day Fair Saturday movement engaging in its first celebration of St Andrew's Day Fair Saturday? Our message would be that we want to create bridges. Bridges between different, uh, first of all, among citizens. And one of the best ways to do that is through culture. Because through culture, we build, we reach better societies. We will like to say to all the Scottish uh, people to be part of it and to participate supporting these cultural organizations because they will be supporting social causes at the same time and this is really great. Well, thank you, Jordi Alberetta Ureda and congratulations on the Fair Saturday movement and best wishes for, for this year's event. Coming up after the break, I'll be speaking to some of Scotland's emerging artistic talent who are comparing notes with some of our more established international stars. Join us then. Welcome back. In our Burns Night special, we featured the music of Rabbi's namesake, Ryan Burns, who had just launched his first CD. We had a great reaction to Ryan's reworking of traditional Burns love song, A Fond Kiss. Alex caught up with Ryan in Edinburgh to see how his career is developing. And I'm delighted to be joined once again on the Alex Salmon Show by Ryan Joseph Burns. Ryan, it was Burns' night uh, earlier this year that you appeared singing A Fon Kiss on the show and it was hugely popular online. So let me tell me, how's your record been doing since then? What's happening? It's, it's going great, actually. It's, um, the first album has kind of been gathering steam. Uh, I've been still playing shows and uh, then my Burns record as well has just added an extra audience to my uh, music, so it's been since I last seen you, it's been it's been going well. And you're one of the Scottish young Scottish artists who've added a new interpretation, a new dimension to, to Robert Burns' magnificent uh, uh, body of work. I think Robert Burns would have been quite pleased that his namesake was taking his uh, his material in a different direction, would he not? Well, I, I would like to think so. Eh? Um, I, there's certain songs I just thought that everything was maybe a bit. It was a little lost in, you know, shortbread and tartan with Robert Burns, so I thought I'd try and bring it into a, a, maybe a different light, look at it from a different angle, and he was a bit of a punk himself, so there's a couple of... Now, I hear there's been a change in your circumstances which means you've had to put all that sort of sex, drugs and rock and roll, <laughs> rock star life behind you. What's happened to you? Uh, well, I just I, about two weeks ago became a, a father to a wee boy, Caelan Robert Burns, for the first time. So, yeah, my life has changed uh, slightly in the last couple of weeks, but... For the better, I've um, I've sat in the house and stared at a baby for two weeks, which has been great. Yeah, you're songs. a fully responsible adult artist now. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Well, since you're now a, a fully responsible adult, I've got something here to to wet the baby's head. So you're entitled to the Alex yeah. Salmon Quay. Thank you so much. Cheers, Brian. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. My 
hand on my head and my hair tenderness We arms that could reach out the sea My feet next be big But the insects are safe I'll never get stood on me And I take it a book And then I go home for my tea I save the coupons That come with the soup And when I have saved 53 I send a 50 Put three in drawer, and something gets posted to me. Scotland the opportunity to celebrate its music in all of its forms. Sheena Wellington is one of Scotland's best known traditional singers, famous for her performance at the grand opening of the Scottish Parliament in 1999. Caitlin Heathcote is a classical musician at the very start of her career studying at Guildhall. Alex and I spoke to them in Edinburgh about the contrast between their experience and musical styles. Sheena Wellington, Caitlin Heathcote, welcome to this very special St Andrew's Day edition of the Alex Salmon Show here from Edinburgh. We're here, of course, to discuss music across the generations. And Caitlin, if I may start with you, a very young musician, <laughs> studying now at Guildhall. Yeah. Previously studying at Purcell, I think, in St Mary's, sorry, in yeah. Edinburgh, <laughs> then on to Purcell in Watford and now at, at Guildhall. What took you and your studies to London from Scotland? If I could stay in Scotland, I would. I absolutely love it here, but unfortunately, just the opportunities that you get down south and the sheer amount of orchestras and teachers and things like that is kind of second to none. If you want to get in the scene, you kind of have to be there. Obviously, there, there are opportunities there when you when you play at events. And yeah. well, give us give us an idea of where have you played? What have you done? We're very lucky, obviously, being a music college. You get to play a lot. It's nice because sometimes you'll get an email and it's so and so needs an oboist in Kent tomorrow for this concert. Can you come and do it? And it's just great because you never really know what's going to pop up next. Yeah, so just all around the place, really. <laughs> Sheena, do you see? Can you understand from? 
from Caitlin's point of view, why she might, despite wanting to, to study and, and oh, play Oh, indeed, Scotland. indeed I can. And if you are going to go to London for music, the Guildhall is the place to go, and, and I think that's great. I, I think there is a critical mass when it comes to music, and particularly classical music in a really big city like London, which has got a, lot, a number of orchestras and things. It's great. Um, as long as you come back, <laughs> make the contacts. And your own, your own career, uh, Sheila, in, in traditional Scottish music, uh -huh. I mean, obviously, uh, tremendous audiences around Scotland, but that's given you an international reach as well. I mean, I'm sure you've been in many tours where there are Scots expats waiting to hear oh, the there traditional are, Scottish uh, songs. Amazingly, and they always want you to sing the Rowan Tree as well and things like that. Um, it is a, a great it's calling card. I know it is. That's why I said that. Scotland, coming, being a traditional musician from Scotland is a calling card. It's a great calling card. We've got a great reputation right across the world for, for music. It's not just burdens, it's it's the other things. It's all the bands that have been touring since. So the idea of Scotland, yeah. the brand, which of course has been very much product-based, clearly yeah. extends to our artistic. The music, yes. And it's beginning, I think, to extend to classical as well, because we are producing some really fine young classical musicians across the disciplines, which is great. I mean, I want to see Scotland producing the best in everything. <laughs> and in terms of sort of the future for yourself, Caitlin, um, where, what's next for you after Guildhall? Because obviously it was, it's great for you to be there and you've heard from, yeah. from Sheena herself. It's, you know, if you're going to study in London, that, that's the place to go. What are, your, what are your plans for the future? Less plans, more hopes, I think. <laughs> um, is for me, a freelance career would be the dream. I love the fact that as a student, people kind of draft you in to do all sorts of crazy things. So like musicals and chamber music and film recordings and orchestra and whatever. And I think keeping that variety really keeps it alive um, and you don't get stuck in your little um, classical musician bubble. So Shane, if you were to turn the clocks back to, to Caitlin's young and, and fantastic <laughs> years, <sighs> is there anything in your career, in your musical career, that you might have done differently anywhere Oh, she might have gone. You're just pleased with, with what you've done and the tremendous amount you've achieved because we're I still listening to you. I want to know today. if you've been tempted by the bright lights. Well, when you, as, a, as a young woman, did you feel that uh, London was going to be your scene at any point? 24 hours in London is usually enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Even when I was younger, I was never a great fan. I think my, I keep on saying to people, my career has been entirely accidental. And I think all the best careers are accidental, and I, I'm delighted that Caitlin wants to do freelance because it's much more exciting. <laughs> I think so. It's it's, so. it's trancy at times, but that's what makes it good. And you get all sorts of opportunities yeah. when you're freelance. And I think I think I, I've just kind of fallen into. Now we're at St Andrews uh, Day Special, and uh, I, I know that you know you're someone who's loved to sing Scottish songs that people are very familiar with, but also uh, look to. Uh, to perhaps see with Burns melody to go back to the original melody that that, that Burns actually set to the to, to the words. Yeah. So give us an example of that. Well, this is the, this is probably one of the most famous ones. It's my love's like a red red rose, which George Thompson, his editor, set to a tune called Low Down in the Broom because he didn't like the major Graham of Inchbrecky, which was. Burns choice. So it, the, 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 that the one that Thompson said it to is the one that everybody knows. Yes. yes. My love is like that's a, the one. Etc. Yeah. And what's the other one? See, is a good tenor. Mm. Um, <laughs> the other one is, oh my love's like a red red rose that's newly sprung in June, and my love's like the melody. That sweetly played in tune As fair art thou, my bonny lass Deep in love am I And I will love thee still, my dear Till all the seas run dry Till all the seas run dry, my dear, and rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sun's all life still run. Beautiful. Terrific. And there's a line in there about rocks melting with the sun, which brings me on to, Alex, what you'd said about education, the importance of education, free education, university education for young people. How important 
a part does music or should music play in the education of our children from primary one upwards? Crucial, absolutely crucial. And actually before primary one, it should be in the nurseries. And it is more in the nurseries. It's when you get into primary one, you get teachers who are frightened to sing and all this kind of thing. It's getting, in some places it's getting better. Um, but music is an integral part of education and it can, it can add so much everywhere. I'm yeah. sure you'd agree with that. I had, um, we had someone come in and speak to us at school once and they said that music actually is one of the most employable degrees because if you've gone and done a music degree and you go off into the world, people see that you're a musician, they know that you're disciplined, you can force yourself to practice when you need to, they know you're organised. If, if you're not organised musician, no one's going to ask you back, basically. They know you've got all of these life skills that you need. Well, that's wonderful. Of course, we've heard from you your beautiful singing. That was wonderful, Sheena. We'll get to hear from you, Caitlin, at the end of the show, and you're going to give us a piece um, on your oboe. But in the meantime, Alex has a gift from us to you both. Well, obviously, I, I stole all my best political lines from Robert Burns. And uh, <laughs> Sheena, you have some of your greatest songs from Burns' original okay. setting of okay. My Love's Like a Red, Red Rose. But Burns also said that Freedom and whiskey gang together. Oh, uh, thank so, you uh, very much. Uh, uh, you know the you. drill. Lovely. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I'm not sure, age wise. Yeah, Just we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> the, uh, the whiskey in the quay, oh. and then oh. round all your musical friends. And uh, well, Sheena, uh, I, mean, I think we should have got you a bigger quake for all your admirers. <laughs> Sheena and Caitlin, thank you very much for your inspiring words. Thank you for asking us. Thank you. St Andrew's Fair Saturday is a wonderful concept. As a counterpoint to Black Friday, it hails a day of giving rather than receiving, of which, from what we know of Andrew from the Gospels, he would have approved. It might provide the St Andrew's Day Committee with the impetus to secure the National Family Day of Celebration, for which they have long strived, as well as giving the country an opportunity to make a statement of solidarity with those up against it at home and internationally. Let us hope so. In any event, the celebration of Scotland's National Day will always provide a showcase for the best in emerging artistic talents. And so what better way to end our special programme than to be played out by Caitlin on her favourite instrument, the oboe. <laughs>